Hey everyone, welcome to another action-packed episode of ARG Presents. I'm Amigo Aaron, joined as always by Mr. Blue Sky himself, John Boat of Car Schaller. Mr. Blue Sky! Oh man, ELO's rolling over in their graves, and they're not even dead! Oh! oh. So, if you joined us last week, you'll recall that the wheel was spun, the deal was made for us to play games on the beloved Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive. Bo, did you ever own a Genesis in your long, illustrious console-owning career? I have. I've owned both the original Genesis and the Model 2. The first model Genesis being vastly superior. It's cooler looking, it isn't looks it? Which awesome. is why I went for the first model. Uh, just a little bit about the uh, Mega Drive slash Genesis. Of course, this thing was released at different pl times and different places. In North America, this was released on August 14th of 89, just under the wire uh, of the 80s. Uh, in Japan, released just a little a little bit earlier, as in a year, bam, October of 88. Mm. And then you got your uh, PAL versions uh, sometime around September of 90. So that was, it's funny, they, they staggered it by about a year uh, between the two. Now, this was not a big seller in Japan. Uh, uh, it pretty much got trounced. Uh, for the most part, but it ended up rallying in uh, America and in in, uh, in Europe. It was very popular in Brazil. Brazilians loved the master system, so they just cruised right on up to this, right? Um, this thing uh, has a 68,000 processor in it. If you're a fan of our other show, Amigos, you'll know that that's a pretty popular processor in the Amiga line. And uh, so you had some back and forth porting uh, that went on there. Uh, this uh, this thing was uh, available uh, from Sega. It, they made this thing from 1988 all the way to 1997. Wow. Which is a hell of a run. Yeah. And it was it was pretty popular. And of course, it duked it out with uh, the Super Nintendo uh, and briefing the Nintendo for the uh, for the main spot of that era. And, it, and at various times, pu had pulled ahead. Uh, now, I, I think overall in sales, I'm not sure. Do you think the Genesis jumped ahead? I think Super Nintendo probably ended up selling more. I don't know. I think worldwide, I can tell you the figures for this anyway. World, this thing sold thirty point seven five million units mm -hmm. worldwide, and then uh, they licensed it to a few other places that sold some tech toy, which I believe they sell the Brazilian version. Three million. Yeah, I, I think the Genesis had a longer lifespan than the Super Nintendo on the market, so it probably sold more more consoles. So, do you want to guess the best-selling game for the uh, Genesis? This is a real tough one. I'm going to guess. Uh, is it one of the Sonic games? It's Sonic the Hedgehog. Right. Fifteen million units. Wow. Um, of course, uh, the launch price of this uh, in the United States mm -hmm. was a hundred and eighty-nine dollars. Right. Not bad. It's uh, very similar to the. I think the the Super Nintendo launched around the same around the same price. Right, and then and by today's money, that'd be three hundred eighty six bucks. So you know that's it sounds like a ton, but uh, it's not as much as as you would think. Uh, the Genesis did have some online capabilities. Did it have what Nintendo don't? It did. Mm. Uh, it had a thing called X Band, uh, which my brother actually has one of the X Band cartridges. I, I've never actually seen one in use. Now, have you ever done any of the networking stuff? Yeah, the, the Super Nintendo also had an X Band right. modem. That's did, right. And uh, I played it for the first time at our friend uh, Mike and Jamie's house. Oh, they yeah? had one back in the day. Uh, they also, now I remember hearing about this, they had the Sega Mega Net and the Sega Channel. I And my friend Joey had the Sega Channel. Really? How, do you remember how that worked? Yeah, it was a cartridge and it plugged in. It had like a phone line or something that came into it. And uh, you basically downloaded games over over you know a broadband or not broadband a modem <laughs> connection <laughs> you know over a T1 line like everybody had in 1989. How did it work? Do you remember? Did it work pretty well? It seemed yeah. like it would work okay. Yeah, I mean the games were pretty small. Because I guess it would just and, write the game to the cartridge, yeah. and when you'd play until it was done. So effectively, you would have the cartridge until you were done. And with the, it. the cartridge was also the UI, so there was a menu, and you just scroll through, and you pick the game that you wanted. Um, I don't know that they offered you know. Uh, Top tier titles on the Sega Channel. It was sort of, I think, akin to, uh, uh, you know, the lower lower class of games. But yeah, it was definitely the first thing of its kind that I ever saw. Even though Atari also had, did you know that they had I, they had a I similar do service? Recall, yeah, and they even mm -hmm. had a uh, they even made a tape uh, a tape drive for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, which was uh, pretty un unusual. Mm -hmm. I believe it, it even had a version of like Frogger on it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of neat. So we would be remiss uh, if we didn't talk about the Genesis. 
and its crazy peripherals. Now, some of which I'm sure will come, will play one of these days when the wheels spun. But uh, the Genesis had had quite a few nutty peripherals and and add-ons. Uh, again, this is your this is your mo first model here. Uh, and one thing about the first model is it outputted its sound in in mono, basically. And so, if you wanted stereo for this, you actually have to take your sound out via the headphone jack. Mm. It is stereo, which I always thought that was kind of weird. And there, are, of course, you can mod these things out the yin yang. This one should be modded to work better because it's not. <laughs> it's on again, off again. This one has the cool volume control too. So you could get wacky peripherals. And the, and the and the first thing that came out for it was the add-on CD. Now, did you ever know anyone that had one of these add-on CD uh, elements? I knew a guy that had the all-in-one um, unit that was produced by JVC. Sure, the real nice, it looks like a little CD player mm -hmm. almost. But yeah, I yeah. never had that somebody was, that just rammed it on the side. Yeah, that was well, that was well. And now, of course, the, on this version, uh, this thing plugged, this thing would, I think this one would set in it, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think they both did. And then uh, um, you'd have your CD over here. And then you also had, uh, a uh, uh, these X thirty the thirty two X which was like a uh, it's kind of a mushroom sh shaped deal that just fits in the cartridge slot. It's got its own cartridge slot and it would play thirty two X games. I actually got one of these things. The problem with all these wacky peripherals is well, there's a bunch of problems actually, and one of which is you have to power them all separately. This is a colossal pain uh, because you've got your power jack here, and then you've got to have th you've got three huge power bricks. Uh, sort of the inverse one. problem of the Coleco Atom. <laughs> we just got one massive <laughs> yeah. one. My God, can you mention three of those things? You'd, oh you'd blow a hole in the floor. <laughs> yeah. But these ain't small. Something else, if you're using different versions of the Genesis, you could have different video cables to hook into these various items. Because, for example, the 32X, it plugs in here. Right, easy enough. Then you've got to run the video from this to the 32X, and then you have another cable that goes from the 32X to your television, right? Wow. Plus, added bonus, the much more popular and much more widely sold Model 2 takes a different video out than this. So you have to have a special cable for just this type right here, which you had to, and which I had to buy separately. Luckily, they're not too hard to get, but still, pain in the butt. And so, on top of everything else, uh, you've got a cartridge slot plugging into another cartridge slot. So if you've got dirty pins or, uh, uh, any weird connections, then it's not going to work, which I had to clean the heck out of mine. So, yeah, a lot of people think those crazy peripherals sunk this thing like a stone. And uh, the 32X, as famously is known, was released directly before they, <laughs> before the Saturn came out. Mm -hmm. So everyone knew that, why would you buy this? And no one did. And so there you go. But that's a topic for another time. We're going to talk about this thing when it was in its prime. It was punching out the good stuff. And we've picked a couple uh, titles here, sort of at random, to uh, to talk about. Uh, I will go first this week. I'll lead the charge boat, if I, if I may. And we're going to talk about uh, the adventures of Batman and Robin. Now, this is a Batman property, clearly. And this is... Uh, a property that is that is from the animated series. <clears throat> uh, so before we get into the game, I want to talk a little bit about the animated series, of which I am a, a big fan. I'm, I love this show. I watched the I watched the debut episode when it debuted in America on prime time. I think it was on Leather Wings was the very first episode that I ever saw, and uh, I have got the whole run on DVD. Love it. Love the love the show. And so I was looking at this game with a critical eye. So. Uh, this show ran for a long time in, in, in various ways. Uh, it, it debuted on uh, September 5th, 1992, and then the original Batman the Animated Series ran until 95. Uh, the reason this is called Batman, The Adventures of Batman and Robin is at, at a certain point in the run of the series, uh, Fox decided to add, have them change the title and have Robin be a continual character uh, to appeal to more kids. <clears throat> I will say, normally I would be appalled, but they actually made Robin have to be pretty awesome in this show. In fact, they had several Robins, uh, just like in the comics, and uh, Ro the original Robin from Batman the Animated Series ended up becoming Nightwing, and then they had another Robin come in, Jason Todd, and, and he was still a pretty cool character. Which one got killed by the Joker? In the comics, Jason Todd got killed. He was the least popular <laughs> Robin. Um, that's a very famous... It's a very famous graphic novel or, or comic series called The Killing Joke. I believe that was The Killing Joke. And uh, uh, 
it's very popular. I mean, it's of all the Batman's ever released, I'd say it's probably the number one most famous thing that they ever did was killing off poor, the Joker, killed off poor Jason Todd. Uh, but uh, that stuff didn't really happen, although he met a different fate. If you watch the animated series, which, just go watch it. I'm not going to try to get into that because that's years and years away. So this game came out uh, right when they had swapped over to the new title. With the new title, uh, again, every episode would feature Robin more prominently, which wasn't a, a, a huge deal. So this game came out in uh, uh, February of 95. Now, actually, it got a release in Europe earlier, one month earlier. Uh, so for, for once, they got the title before uh, we did in America. It was developed by an outfit called Clockwork Tortoise. Um, their opening screen on here it looks like it was drawn by a four-year-old. I don't <laughs> know what they were going for there, but it, it was I didn't like it. So what is this game? Well, the game is sort of what you would think it would be. Um, you, you get to choose between Batman and Robin, and you can have one or two players simultaneous, in which case someone plays Batman and someone plays Robin. And you go through the game uh, to beat these various levels, and the levels are split up like episodes of the show, uh, and, which I'll get into in a little while. But you, the, each each uh, major level has th four or five like minor levels in it, and maybe a few like lower level bosses that are related to the main bad guy, uh, and that's how it goes. It's pretty standard fare, really, for this for this sort of stuff. Um, so the premise of this game is. Uh, you're you're eventually going after Mr. Freeze, who's sort of the heavily billed bad guy in this. Uh, Mr. Freeze appeared in the animated series in one of the cinematic releases, or it's actually probably directly a DVD, uh, a Mr. Freeze, ep basically an hour and 20 minute long episode uh, that they did with just Mr. Freeze. He was a pretty prominent did character. Did he make all kinds of awesome puns like Arnold did? No, uh, he... no. Oh. It's funny, um, just as a, a slight sidebar, I was a big fan of the show, and I hated all the the movie Batman's. I really, I, I thought the first one was okay. I tolerated the second one, and then that was the end of my patience with the Batman <laughs> series. I was done. And of course, now it's in vogue to make fun of these things, but trust me, they've all. They, I really haven't liked any of them that much. The first one was okay, but even it wasn't that great, uh, in my opinion. And so, uh, the animated series had a theatrical release, and it was called The Mask of the Phantasm. Uh, and it came out, and I can't quite remember the year, but I remember it was wintertime. Because I remember I was on my way to see it when when my car stopped. With me, my mom, and I think Brent in the car. And so I had to hike across the interstate down over a hill to somebody's house to get somebody to come help us. Oh my gosh. And I remember being so mad. I was like, well, I'm not going to be going to see Batman tonight. <laughs> but I ended up seeing like the next day. And it was so much better. If you haven't seen Mask of the Phantasm, I urge you to go see it. It's a great, great film. And... Uh, it crushes anything that had been released at that point. Now, the newer Batmans that have been released in the past few years are more tolerable. Uh, they thieve a lot of stuff from the animated series, uh, but they're still not great. If you want to see good quality Batman adventures, the DC Animated Universe is the way to go. So, anyway, it was it was easy to... to it, it seems like it would be easy to take the elements that made up Batman and put them in a game. Um... Uh, and this game did so with sort of mixed results, uh, in my opinion. So, like I said, you've got various levels. Let's talk about these different levels and sort of the ep in the episodic way that they're presented. The first episode is called "Happy Birthday to Me," and it's a Joker episode. Now, if you watch, now are these actually based on episodes from these the animated series? Okay. These are not. And by the way, this isn't the first game to do this, and it wouldn't be the last. It was. Uh, the the, Ninten the Super Nintendo version of uh, of the Batman animated show did a very uh, it's the exact same thing, but the game is radically different. Uh, not radically, but it's just it's a different game. It's not the same game, so it's not something that you haven't seen before. So in this one, you're trying to stop the Joker. Uh, he him and his gang are basically robbing a bank and jewelry store. There's not really a coherent theme to these things. There's not like a bunch of cutscenes, and there's no animation, there's no voice, there's none of that stuff, which is a sh sort of a shame. Uh, so, <clears throat> in the first in the first level of this one, uh, like I said, you're going after the Joker's gang, and the, the gang is presented like clowns. Some of the clowns are big, oafy guys. Some of them have guns. Uh, you know, it's a generic beat-em-up stuff. 
and it's split into like an upper and lower level. Uh, sort it's of, all like bad dudes. And it, in some ways, in fact, there's another level in this game that's really, really like bad dudes. But basically, uh, you, you're Batman or Robin, and you've got really a couple attacks. You've got like a, 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 a projectile that you could upgrade. Then you've got just sort of a generic batarang. And then when the guys get close to you, that batarang turns into punches and kicks. Um, so right out of the gate, I had a trouble with this game. And the, the reason I had trouble, I have trouble with any of these games where Batman throws like four million batarangs. Now, even if you've only seen the movies, you would know that Batman doesn't... He'd have to have a sack of batarangs. He, he throws them like he's dealing cards. That's I mean, right. It's... He's gambling, he ain't. <laughs> and, and, and the fact that Batman's using all these projectiles, it always irritates me. It, and you have to use them. You don't have a choice. Right. Um, the the fact that these low level flunkies give Batman so much trouble that irritates me too. Batman's skills as a detective kind of downplayed in this time. Not a, not a not a not a peep. Of course, Roy, it's like the bad guys are being subtle. Right. You know, I mean, the first level, the whole screen shaking, this crap. You know, it's crazy time. So this is good. I knew right there. I was like, this is going to be one of those, and it is. I mean, this is more akin to something like a Contra mm -hmm. than it would be to a Batman game. Yeah. If if Contra could go fisticuffs with you, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the second thing I noticed right out of the gate was this game was merciless. <laughs> I mean, I played this game a lot this week, and I never beat the first... I never beat Harley in her tank. That's how I would get beat there every time. I couldn't get past the first level, and I played. I tried really, really hard, and I could not do it. It is difficult, and the key to it is because it, the first actual stage was not that tough. When, what what makes it tough is when the guys come out with those guns. Mm -hmm. They come in pairs, and they sh they have like a triple shot, and they shoot uh, in different directions at you, and it's really tough to very dodge. Hard to, it's very hard to avoid them. On top of that, you've got these big clowns that come out and that you have to deal with, and they're real tough mm -hmm. uh, to deal with. But I could get pa I could get to the point where. The game gives you the ability to have six continues, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. Right, because you I, only get two lives. Right, and so I could get to the point where Harley Quinn comes up with her tank, the birthday tank, and she would. Oh, I never got past her. So you know what that meant. I had to resort to trying to cheat. I had to resort to watching videos. Were you able like. to get? I couldn't figure out. There is a level select code that I. I, found. I never got it to work. I couldn't once. get it to work either. <clears throat> No, I had to download some save games and play with an emulator, which mm. I don't like to do. Um, so, like I said, the boss on that level is Harley. She comes out in a tank. All right, it's it's a odd. Um, it's okay. Harley is a is what a lot of people don't know this, but Harley was a unique character to the show. She didn't exist in the comic books. They mm -hmm. made her up for the show. Yeah. So I always thought that was kind of cool. And of course now she's you know she's huge. one of the biggest stars yeah. in the it's universe. It's funny how that works. Uh, the hotness, I'm sure, mm -hmm. came into play. Yes. So. You go through, the, most of the first level is just basic stuff. Uh, there's a level where you have to fight a bunch of copters, and then eventually Harley comes back, and, and you have to fight her. Plus, you have to fight this crane that's uh, coming back and forth. And I, will I say often it, fight cranes. The effect, the effect of the uh, crane is awesome. I will give them credit. Do you remember the game um, Balls? I think that's what it was called. It was, it was all based on balls. Yeah, it's like, like a fighting game, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of another game that has that kind of same kind of gimmick where the, there's a series of balls in a line and they use it to make the illusion of... Th yeah, of, of, it's of, like of scrolling, it. or it's like scaling, using right. using balls to scale. And and this that is one of the, that little scene reminds me of what irritates me about this game. Hidden in this mess of gaming, yeah, difficulty-wise, is some pretty nice effects. Some nice scrolling, it runs fast. Uh, it looks pretty good. I mean, I was I always looked. I thought it looked pretty good, uh, for the most part. And but that I'd say the, the of all the things I saw, I thought the crane was the most interesting thing in the whole game visually. Mm -hmm. I thought right. it was interesting to look at. So uh, eventually, you run across the game, which are the the series of uh, events in the first level that reminds me of Bad Dudes, where you run around the, on this endless convoy of trucks before you finally get to the Joker in a huge. Uh, like a uh, chompy, big chomping mouth, hot air balloon, and you have to take him down. I will say, when the Joker dies or falls, he lays down and just looks like mauled. It's uh, it's pretty appealing because the Joker's a, a pretty amusing foil. Now, the Joker never actually dies in any of the versions of the Batman universe, right? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, in the comic books, everyone dies a million times. I mean, so it's hard to say. But I mean, in the animated show, 
And, uh, well, again, you'd have to really get into it and watch it. That's uh, If you're going to watch a Batman Beyond, which was sort of the natural end of that show, I think he does meet his demise, but but no one's really sure. Right. Um, by the way, just uh, Batman in the, in the show is voiced by a guy named Kevin Con, uh, Con, Conroy, I think is his name, Conway. And the Joker is voiced by Mark Hamill of Star of Star Wars fame. And he's got a lot of he's got a lot of praise for I his I think he's ability. probably more famous from his role in Wing Commander, to be honest. He with was you. listen, I liked Wing I liked him in Wing Commander. I, I liked him in everything he's done. Uh, but this, his Joker is the he's the best, he, yeah, the best. He, his Joker is you really know, good. He is number one with a bullet. So uh, that's the first level. I'm not going to be as full with all these other levels. So the second level is is Two Face. Okay, it's called a two sided story. This one, the first section, just puts you on an ele- it's the old elevator level. Yeah, the, right. We've the all worst. seen them. Yeah, it reminds me of. Uh, uh, heavy it's barrel like or something. Streets of Rage. Yeah, how they've all got them. And then uh, you have to fight some a uh, Zeppelin's cannons. Now this this level does do something that is sprinkled throughout the game. It has a flying level. Um, it is generic. Um, it's generic looking shooter basically. I mean, it's just it's not it's plain Jane. There was nothing special about it in my opinion. I wasn't overly impressed with it. I mean, this this was not our type. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's just it's just some. It's okay. It breaks up the other parts of the level, but it's not like I was like going like, oh yeah, this is the stuff. If you'll recall, there was another Batman game where they added like a driving level, and the driving level was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Like you're like, oh, this is nice. This I would say is a step below that. Um, so the the boss at this one, you finally end up fighting this huge helicopter, and you have to fight Two Face himself. You know, say la vie. So, the third level, probably my favorite level, Tea Time. Tea Time features the Mad Hatter. In a cartoon, he's voiced by Roddy McDowell, which I, I absolutely love. Roddy. I don't know anything about him. Really? Yeah. You don't know who Roddy McDowell is? Mm-mm. I thought you were going to say Roddy, Roddy Piper. Do you know who, you ever watched uh, Planet of the Apes? No. Have you ever seen uh, Fright Night? Uh, we've reviewed it on Amigos. So, you haven't seen the movie, no. though? You don't know who Roddy McDowell is. You ever seen Hell House? These don't sound like movies I would watch. Okay. Well, trust me when I tell you. He was, he was like president of the Screen Actors Guild for like a long time. He's a big deal. Okay. So look him up. But he's awesome. He did the voice of the Mad Hatter, and he did it great. So I was sort of looking forward to a Mad Hatter level. But this level I, is ridiculous. I mean, I, I cheated my way to get there, and it was I couldn't do anything. I just got mauled. Super tough level. Uh, the... Uh, uh, it's called Tea Time, and there's on the first level. This is these things that are. I had to look up what they were called. They're called shock puppets. These things, they suck. I mean, they're. I couldn't get past them to save my life. They were just really tough. Um, and this one, you fight a robotic cat face that's curtain draws. You have to fight this big flat face, and these little cat paws come out. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it's very strange. What do you want? And then you also fight a Robo Pinocchio at one point. <laughs> now that I can get behind. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, there's also a neat section. It's, it's a flying section where you're flying down a tunnel, and the tunnel scrolls out like this, and it's real well done. It's another mm-hmm. aspect. It's like of the a game. trench, trench, trench run sort of deal. I'm trying to think what I could compare it to. Sort of, it's sort of like Stun Runner or something. Just like it was really neat the way it was, and it was real uh, trippy, you know. But again. That was cool, but it's a lot like a Laserdisc game. I look at that background, but the foreground not not so good. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, you uh, of course you fight you fight the boss, and he's got he flies around his huge hat, and he's you know which I guess he could do that, but anyway, <laughs> I didn't think that was that good either. So finally, you get to the end, and it's called Snow in July. Uh, again, it's some snow stuff. There's flying with a jetpack. You fight Mister Freeze. Wham bam, Bob's your uncle. You crack his helmet, kill him. Or wipe him out, and at the end of the game, it shows him in Arkham telling Batman he's going to get vengeance. And then that—I mean—the ending of this was crap. crap. It's like that's all. It was what you would expect. Mm-hmm. Uh, now here's a news flash: this company never did another thing. <laughs> <laughs> so they were well known for really pushing the limits, but in the end, they didn't make a good game. Uh, and this game is just known as being too difficult. To, you know, push comes to shove. So, your thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, I, I really wanted to like this game because at first 
I thought, well, I can get behind this. It's 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 got simple controls. I like the way that you can jump up on the ledge above you and, and swing and, out and, and, and kick, kick the guys. Yeah, I thought that was that's cool. That's great until the gutters come out. Yeah, then you're then you're boned. Uh, there are some control things that that hamper this game. One is you don't turn fast enough. Uh, in Contra, you know, you, you you are able to you hit the button and the guy immediately spins around. There's a slight delay that means certain doom in this game. Um, you know, it's it's not a one hit kill game. You do have a health bar, and there are power ups scattered about. But I I always get frustrated when I can't even beat the first level, yeah. and that's that's where I was with this one. This game is known for its difficulty, so it's not as usual. I know how to pick them, uh, and this is a tough one. Um, in fact, the, the the third level has been called one of the hardest levels in any game, uh, so your mileage may vary. You know, I wanted to like it too, but there were, again, I knew right out of the gate, I'm like, here we go. Batman chucking all these stupid batarangs. And, and and I knew when I got to the level with all the gun guys, if there was one gun guy, I mean, this is the, this is the first, this is like the third screen of the first level. Let us figure out what we're doing, yeah. for God's sake. I thought that this game had, I mean, it's sort of in the, in the beat-em-up tradition, but even for a beat em up, it had so many bad guys. Yeah. I mean, they really open the floodgates, and these guys just pour out. And you can't really, like, there aren't, like, I like a lot of games where you can pick up and, like, toss them and, like, wipes out a bunch of guys. This isn't that type of game. No. It's more of a shooter. Mm -hmm. it's if you're like, in a hand to hand combat zone, you, you're way, they're way too close. I would call it a Grizor clone. Now, you can build up your secondary weapon, all right? And after a while, that really gets you a long ways. But mm -hmm. I can never get far enough to build it up enough. I mean, I just, well, I, I would build it up to where I felt like I was good, and then I would die and lose it. And, so. that, and it's it's so frustrating, especially those and also when you take those continues. Of course, as usual, you start at the beginning of the level, which is beyond it's frustrating. No so yeah, I can't I can't say that I enjoyed it. No. I tried to, I, and even the animation, so it's okay. But, you know, not having the voice acting and not having any sort of cutscenes was a real letdown. Now, with that said, the Mega Drive verse, the Mega Drive, the Mega CD version of this has little clips in it. It has voice acting, uh, which would probably go a long way, but I still don't think I could recommend it even with that stuff. Just, I mean, I would probably watch the video, but not actually, you know, want to play the game. Um, this reviewed, and it was, it, it did okay, really. Sega Mag gave it a 90. Player One gave it 87. Uh, video Games 85. Here's a good. Here's a good magazine. Quebec Gamers 80. Retro Gaming History though. This is when they start to dip. The newer reviews 70 percent. Well, look what year that Quebec Gamers is. Yeah, 2010. Mm -hmm. So they they had. You'd think they would have killed it. EGM gave it a, a 6.9 uh, out of 10. So, you know, and boy, here you go. The Video Game Critic, February 2006, 33D+. And then, uh, so those were not the best scores, but they. It, would you give this an 80 or a 90? I, just, no. I couldn't do it. Now, we're not great. So maybe if you're really awesome at the game, you might. I don't know. So on eBay, this was rather a surprise. You know, when we've been doing these console games, and you think Genesis games, they're, they're giving these things out when you buy a, a cheeseburger, right. right? Not this one, they're not. Mm. Um the card only, right, 18 to 22 bucks, right, which that's a lot for just the card. Yeah. The uh, uh, a box copy of this, you're going to say, I saw, and this is mostly on the high end of this, between 30 and 70 bucks. Oh my gosh. And then I saw a couple sealed copies. That, in fact, there was one up 100 bucks and they'd sold. So there you go. This is a, now, a collectible look, title. I looked up the Mega Drive versions to see if there's a, any variance there. Um, Someone in China is making these things, which that right there tells you they've got some worth because mm -hmm. they wouldn't be cranking these out if they didn't. Sixteen bucks, and but if you want a boxed version, a Mega Drive version, one hundred twenty-five bucks, and it's sold. Boy. So there you go. So if you want to pay a lot of money for and and then be really frustrated, this is a game for you. <laughs> Bo, let's take it. Let's let you take it away. What do you got? All right. So my game this week is Daytona, and by that, that I mean not. virtual racing. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> virtual is not <laughs> virtual. <laughs> it was a couple years before they discovered that was an awesome thing to do. <laughs> so, uh, virtual racing, I'm going to talk a lot about the arcade machine that this is based off of uh, before I get into the, the home conversion. So, right. this was released in 1992 and was developed by Sega AM2. Uh, the individual developer was this guy named Yu Suzuki. 
Have you heard of him before? Yeah, I've heard of him. I thought so, because he invented Space Harrier, Outrun, Hang On, Afterburner, and Virtua Fighter. Yeah, man. <laughs> so what, a, what a resume. He's man. got a little bit of a pedigree. Yeah. Um, this game was uh, an attempt to bring a polygonal... 3D-based racing title into the, the next generation. Uh, of course, the um, there were 3D polygonal racers before this. Um, there was a game called Winning Run in, uh, in 1988 that uses a lot, used a lot of polygons, but uh, hard driving is really, it was the first 3D virtual, or you know, racing simulator, or actually driving simulator. Hard driving's not really a racing game, is it? Which we own, by yeah. the way. I own that game. I'm dying to sell it. <laughs> interested in buying one. But yeah, it, hard driving was the first one I played of that type. Mm-hmm. And man... I remember, I remember being blown away. It's like, holy smokes, this is just like driving a real car. Right, so right. you got a key. <laughs> and so this this game sort of took what hard driving did and just made it better. Made it fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, made it fun. Um, so um, this is uh, this was also the first Virtua title um, that, uh, that that was released. Uh, this became a brand for Sega later on down the line, and they had you know Virtual Racing, Virtual Fighter, Virtual Cop. Virtual on, yeah. Um, so the there were that fighting game. Yeah, there's there's virtual a virtual kids. That's that's a lie. That's not a no, game. No, that's a game. Virtual fighter kids, the little kids. Yeah, mm. I swear to God, look it up. <laughs> um, so the uh, the original arcade game and our our port uh, has three different tracks. Uh, there is uh, they're split into beginner, intermediate, and advanced. The beginner is called the Big Forest. Uh, the intermediate is called the Bay Bridge, and the expert level is Acropolis. Ooh. Yeah. Um, each level has its own special feature that you can view as you're, you're spinning around it. Uh, Big Forest has a uh, amusement park. You can see the Ferris wheel in the background. Uh, Bay Bridge, the big attraction is the bridge, mm, of course. Makes sense. And Acropolis is just known because it's got this it's got this tight hairpin turn. You go down this stretch, and then it literally just doubles back on itself. So those are the three stages. Um, when you select a car, you can uh, choose between different transmission types, and there are some crazy transmission types. There's like there's a special thing you can press to get a seven-speed transmission, which I mean I am I am automatic only <laughs> oh, when it yeah. comes to these yeah. games. Yeah. I don't Wait, need I'm any added that, complexity. Man. Yeah. Um, and the the thing that made this awesome, and I remember playing this for the first time over at Rock Lake. Um, the the uh, <laughs> yes, the yes. the putt putt arcade laser tag arena nearby where we live, and uh, it was just so cool that they had the view the different views. There were three or four different views you could three. select yeah. with with buttons right there on the console. And at I, any time, yeah, at any time. Around. And so it was so cool to be able to see the bird's eye view or get on the cockpit or whatever. So I thought that was awesome. Um, so. Uh, all versions of virtual racing in the arcades were linkable up to eight players, so you could have you could have some pretty massive races. And we've in, done that. Yeah, you were just talking about our buddy. Really. Our buddy who has an arcade in Charleston has uh, what's he got? Four of these linked up, and he's even got little TVs that go on top of them so people can watch you play. Yeah, they they were actually they were known. Those TVs were known as live monitors, and they would sit on top of the twin cabinets and uh, replay action shots occurring with actual players. And there was actually even a virtual commentator named Vert McPolygon. Vert. <laughs> that would give I you play by play. That. Yeah, I yeah. I missed out on Vert. Vert McPolygon, what a name. So, um, home console version of this game. You know, I chose this game to review on the Genesis, and um, this game was too. And the long and short of it is, it's, it was too advanced for the Genesis. They had to do some internal cartridge modifications to get this thing to work. By which means that they soldered a whole new chip onto the cart to give it the ability to push this many polygons out. Um, there was a, uh, a, 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 the cartridge design was known as the Sega Virtual Processor, the SVP. And um, the what everybody remembers about this game, aside from how impressive it was to see on the Genesis, was how expensive it was. Yeah. Uh, in 1994, we're nearing the end of the Genesis's life uh, span, and it was selling for about 100 bucks. This cart retailed for about 100 bucks. 
So yeah. the, the the cart was as expensive as the machine. I believe it had the same circuitry that was like in the 32 X, right? It might, might. Yeah. I mean, it's at least very similar. Now I will tell you that this game, because of because of this chip. Uh, it locked it out of uh, both Majesco's re-release Genesis 3 from 1998, so not the original Genesis 3, but the second model. Yeah. And it wouldn't work on any Genesis with a 32X. You had to take the 32X out there to are, get that to work. You also can't play any. Uh, you can't play any Master System games with the 32X in. Hmm. Yeah. So the 32X has some kind of who knows. Who knows what's going yeah, on in that thing? It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, however, if you have a 32X, you're in luck because the Sega 32X version, which was known as Virtual Racing Deluxe, yeah. uh, it was also released in 1994. So Sega, it was clear that they didn't know what they were doing <laughs> with the 32X. So they, <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute! Wait a minute! They launched this for the Genesis, and then they launched the thing. To play in the special thing the same year? Right. So instead of making Virtual Racer their killer app for their new console, they're like, well, we'll just release a Genesis version, too. <laughs> Can you imagine it's, that? Well, it's 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 the Amiga in action, you now, know? It's, <laughs> now, did you get a price on the Deluxe? Because uh, I'm wondering if the price on the Deluxe was cheap enough to where you could get the 32X plus the Deluxe for under the amount of money it would cost. That, wouldn't that one. be funny? Yeah. Yeah. God, um, I've never heard that. I've played the 32X version. It's better. And it, well, it's got two extra cars and it's got two extra tracks. Yeah. So there's no reason not to get the 32X version. Uh, there was also a Saturn version that I'm sure was yeah, awesome. Which it is. And, uh, and then PlayStation 2 version came out a couple of years later, actually about 10 years later. Um, a couple of years. <laughs> it was called Virtual Racing Flat Out. And I have never, I've never, never played that. that. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, it includes three new courses and four new cars. Really? Yeah. We may have to get that. I've got a PS2. Yeah, mm. yeah. So um, this game, I love this game. I think it's great. It 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 combines a lot of the things that I like about other racing games into one. Um, it's got really, it's a very bright environment. You know, the sky is super blue. The colors really pop. Uh, even though the the textures are all polygonal, they're drawn in a kind of a stylized way. They didn't try and make it too realistic. So, you know, everything is really crisp and bright, even on the Genesis version. Um, the Genesis version does have more pop in. It does have more dithering and things like that. But it's still, it runs super, super fast. Um, they, I didn't detect any slowdown in what I was doing. Uh, I was able to, you know, go through the different, the different viewpoints and everything. It was fine. Um... I was not very good at this game, even at the beginner level. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't win, but I played it a bunch of times. One thing I didn't like is I didn't like that you you couldn't play the other tracks at the beginner level. Like I wish you could have played the hairpin track yeah. at the beginner level. Yeah, and they're, they're, they get tougher yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing I like about this is that um, the. Uh, when you wreck, it's not like pole position where your car blows up and you have to wait for your car to reappear. This is more like Outrun or more like Lotus where, you know, your car spins out of control but always lands on its feet and you're actually right off again. Wrecking you know? is sort of a slight inconvenience. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I like that a lot. What did you think of this game? First of all, I'm a big fan of this in the arcade. Mm-hmm. I played, it, I played it a lot, and I always thought it was fun. And I'm not a big racing guy, but I had some success with this. I always liked it. And I went on to like the Daytonas and the touring cars. I like that. So I'm not necessarily great at them, but they're fun. Mm-hmm. I look at this game in two different lights. As a Genesis game, it's quite astounding. If you consider this was running on a 68,000 processor, then they put in some souped-up junk to make it work. It's amazing to get a playable passable game with that process with that you know, base system that much said uh, the frame rate is not good I've never liked it it's not the arcade is really smooth uh, this is not as smooth this has some weird it it do, you don't get the same feeling when there's a when the ground slants it's very jarring almost it almost feels to me like your car is on the center of the screen, and which is this is it is. I mean, and and, and everything's moving around you, mm-hmm. which it is. But other games, other verses get make the illusion of that work, right. and this one doesn't for me. Uh, it I guess it's just the unsmoothness of the uneven grounds moving around. Uh, this thing doesn't have the little bells and whistles that I like, the cool sparks and all the stuff that 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 you would get in this the other game. This one's got sparks. It's not the same. They're not the same. They don't look as cool. They the uh, uh, I do. I will say it's. I mean, it's as a technical achievement, it's impressive. If I had nothing but a Genesis, all right, 
and this came out, and I was a big fan, and I bought it, I would not be disappointed. Okay, so that's sort of the ultimate compliment. However, the CD32 X ver or the 32 X version is way better. The, the Saturn version is way better uh, than this one. Not just because of the extra stuff. I mean, just it, I mean, which it would be. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a Saturn. Uh, so what I have paid upwards of a hundred dollars for it, which in today's money, God knows how much it is, a couple hundred bucks for this. No, because I, I is this the best racing game on the Genesis? Let's go down that road. This has all that extra hardware, and it costs all that much money. Would you consider this your favorite racing title on the platform? Because it it should be for the extra amount of money you've got to pay, right? I mean, it, can you think of better ones than this one? I mean, it is good. That's why. I, so that's why I posed the question. I think because the Genesis isn't really known for its racing titles, is it? I mean, really. I think you know probably. Well, that no, I still prefer Outrun on the Genesis. Outrun on the See, I, I have good. to agree with you. But no, but Outrun isn't nearly as... Uh, uh, this is a much more challenging title to yeah. pull off. Outrun came out, what, 83 or something right. like this? This came out yeah. you know, <laughs> much, much later. And I really and, and that's that's really, you know, I've played Outrun for years and years and years, and I've barely scratched the surface of, of virtual racing. Maybe virtual racing, it would become my favorite if I gave it some more time. Well, I, I just... I, I, like I said, I can look at this in 2018 eyes uh, because there are other easier, better ways to play it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't too long after this was released. I mean, clearly the same year. Right. Uh, the 32X would have been the way to go. Yeah. And also, you knew that the Saturn was coming. This would probably get ported to that. You know, I probably wouldn't have paid 100 bucks on a, on a console that was at, literally at the very, very edge of its, uh, of its uh, lifespan. I agree with that, you know? for sure. So... All that said, this was also a fool's folly to put this out. The amount of money they spent on this and the amount of time and effort they spent to make this work on the Genesis is one of the main reasons why Sega, you know, got crushed. I mean, they really, this was a, a idiotic, an idiotic waste of money. Uh, I mean, did they achieve their goal? Yes. But at the cost of any sort of sanity, they had this money and time from a team of this quality could have been spent gearing up the Saturn, which they you know, ended up, bot they botched that too. They botched the launch of that. So, you know, it's this, actually, this the Genesis, you know, we talk about all these different consoles, and the Genesis, in my mind, always takes a back seat to the Super Nintendo, in this country, for sure, right? I mean, I think people look at the Genesis less fondly than they do Super Nintendo, and I think part of the reason is, and this, and this I'm going off on a tangent here, but I think part of the reason is the Genesis makes me sad. It was such a promising, great console, and it ended so stupidly. And it was the beginning of the end of Sega as a, as a company that manufactured video games. Well, it was also the beginning of the beginning for Sega, too. It was their beginning well, and... You're right. Yeah, it was. <laughs> they, they, it's like they caught lightning in a bottle, and then they got shocked. Mm -hmm. You know, like, well, they couldn't handle it. Uh, if only they had... I mean, they should, have never, they should never have released that 32X. They shouldn't have released this. Uh, and they should have released the Saturn in a proper way. Then you got something. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, it, yeah, that's, that's my thought. That's it, and and we could we could talk about the, all the follies of you know it, right. Sega couldn't have they couldn't have imagined that three D games would take off the way that they would, and they designed the Saturn primarily as a two D system, and yeah, yeah. there were there were mi mistakes were made, but they were they had screwed up that market. They had screwed up well before the Saturn. Yeah, got well, they, they 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 announced and launched the Saturn on the same I day. Know, was, I know. Something else before we get off the subject. Uh, amongst the other things that bug me about this game is that sometimes, depending on what view you're in, the background would get really just weird. Like it would, like you would almost the track and some of the grass around it would kind of go into this like mystery zone. Mm -hmm. You know, you, there'd be a lot of see through. And again, I feel bad. Uh, I, I don't want to. I'm not here to kill this game because it's an incredible technological feat. But it just it shows you the difficulty of something of this complexity that was smashed into a cartridge and stuck in the Genesis. So in that aspect, it's quite remarkable. If I were to come across one of these cartridges for a, a, a song, I'd buy the hell out of it, just because it's such a... It's just a, 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 an amusing, interesting piece of video game history. Mm -hmm. So on that, I would definitely give it its merits. And as a technical achievement, I give it its merits. And as a playable game, I give it its merits. So I guess, actually, I sort of recommend it, but, you know, I have my qualms about it. <laughs> Uh, it reviewed extremely well. Uh, oh, I it bet. reviewed in, in it reviewed in the eighties and nineties. You know, 
Um, the Genesis magazines, I'm sure, were going through the same thing that the Amiga magazines were going through, where towards the end of any console's lifespan, they're desperately trying to stay in business, and they don't want to give any game a horrible review. But this game is, mm, yeah. is a, it's an outstanding achievement on the system. Yes. Uh, when you consider, you know, that it launched with you know a bunch of arcade conversions. So, um, well, this is an arcade conversion too. But you know what I mean. <laughs> Good job, Bo. Yeah. Um, so uh, this game also won a bunch of awards. Um, so in 1994, it, 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 was, it was awarded fourth place on Mega's list of top Mega Drive games of all time. Mega being a magazine. Fourth place of yeah. all time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, this is, uh, get this. In 2015, it was third place on IGN's list of the top ten most influential racing games ever. Can you, th can you tell me what number one and number two were? Pole position should be up there. That's number one. Um, influential of all time. Of all time. Our run's got to be up there, doesn't it? Well, I mean, I'm sure it's up there, but it's not number two. Um, Think um, more modern. Ridge Racer? Think more modern. More modern than Ridge Racer? Yeah. What Daytona? Game, no, what game sold a billion PlayStation 2s and PlayStation 1s? Ridge Racer? <laughs> Which well, one more, we bought more, ours? More PlayStation 2. Oh, Gran Turismo? Gran Turismo. Yeah, it's yeah, I can understand that because it, it did it was, the genre of over realistic unplayable right, games. Right, right. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the, of the realistic yeah, driving. Yeah, games. Yeah, but anyway, I can I can see pole position sure, Gran Turismo absolutely, because it, I mean you can't deny it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, look this up on eBay. You can have it for a song and selling all day for under twenty bucks. Really? Yeah, complete. Hmm. May have so. to grab it because I can't play this in my own. That's car. true. This would be a good one to yeah. own. All right, Aaron. That concludes our look at the Mega Drive. You know what time it is. It's time to spin the wheel. And make the deal. So, Bo, what do we got this week? So, this week we have a new addition to our wheel. We have the Virtual Boy. Okay. Um, so, we have on the wheel many things. Um, so, we're going to give this wheel a spin and see and how it's going to beat around the bush for Brock. All right, it looks like the Sega SG1000. <laughs> Is the uh, our next <laughs> our next title, the Sega SG One? Boat. I've got no idea what I I have no idea what's in here. I remember what I picked. All right. So that's mine. That's yours. So uh, I think it's your time to go first this time around. Okay, I've picked Girls Garden. <laughs> now, do you know anything about Girls Garden? I do. I do. You do? Yes. Okay. I picked Hero. Hero. And I'm hoping it's like the hero that I know Activision about. Activision's own hero. So, mm -hmm. I guess next week we'll be playing some SG-1000. Sega, Sega. Two in a row. Sounds good. So, if you're into what we do here, if you're down with the wheel, you want to throw us a few bucks, we got a Patreon. Bo, what's the scoop on the Patreon? Amigos.com slash Patreon slash oops. And we... we None of that was correct. Patreon.com slash Amigos Podcast. I would have just kept right on track it, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a few bucks, hey, it'd be great. We'd appreciate it. If not, no biggie, man. And we also are selling some shirts, including some ARG-related shirts. That's right. If you go on over to tpublic.com slash store slash Amiga Tees, you can check them out. Beautiful. So what do you think? SG-1000 next week? Let's do it. All right. So we'll see you next week for some Sega action. And until then, Adios. adios. John making a new podcast.